it. Hello, 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 and welcome to this month. Um, actually, not even this month. I'm doing three in the month of June. Impact panel. We have had over 200 female guest speakers on this Her Version stage up to this point. We have had we have over 200 or uh, 520 YouTube videos of our 145 audio podcasts and 100 or um, 675 members in our Facebook group. Be sure to join us today. We are talking about writing, editing, and publishing your book, the book that has been bubbling inside you for years. I know that putting yourself out there can feel heavy, especially if you're going at it alone. However, the excuse that your story isn't enough is no longer acceptable. Let's not spend another day with that incredible story tucked inside of you. Today, I have Sierra Melker from Red Thread Publishing to give us some pointers on getting your first book on paper, edited, and published so you can move on, so you can move on to your next endeavor. Join us as we dive deep into the world of books and publishing. As always, we have a live QA for these uh, next two hours, so get your questions in the comment section and your comment slash question might pop up on screen. For those of you that don't know me, I am your host, Sabrina Victoria. If you are new to this podcast, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, and share. Let's jump right in. Hello, hello, and welcome to Her Version Impact Panel. The first thing that I like to do when I run these awesome panels is just to kind of go around the room and have each of my ladies introduce themselves with who you are, where you're from, what you do, and why you decided to join us on this panel. I am going to start with Sierra. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of questions, but I think I can handle it. Um, there they are, thank you. You're so welcome. My name is Sierra Melker. I was born in the U.S., lived in a lot of different places in the U.S., so I'm from a lot of places. Then I lived in China, and now I live in Colombia, South America. So I'm in Medellin, Colombia. That's maybe the easiest way to answer that question, but originally from the U.S. Um, I have been a lot of things, and this who are you question is a wonderful uh, open Pandora's box. Um, but I'm just gonna stick with who I currently am since it's sort of on topic. Um, I run an all-female publishing company called Red Thread Publishing. And um, I'm here because Sabrina Victoria, when you introduced this like topic, I thought to myself, is there really anything else to talk about? Because I love talking about writing, editing, publishing, and making an impact. I love so it. I'm sure there are other topics, but this is my joy. So that's why I'm here. Thank you for having me. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Miss Lauren, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and why this subject. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm always glad to be in a room with you, Sabrina. Um, I'm Lauren Lefkowitz. I am an executive leadership coach. Uh, I am formerly a workaholic, people-pleasing perfectionist who had to break both of my shoulders chasing a vacuum in order to realize that my life needed to change. And um, I am in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, so just outside of Washington, DC. And I left my 20 year HR career to become a full-time executive leadership coach and coach other workaholics, people pleasers and perfectionists. And this subject is so exciting to me. I'm just starting my path to writing a book. Uh, a memoir that starts with me falling and breaking both of my shoulders, chasing a vacuum. And um, and so the idea of being in a room full of women talking about all stages of writing um, is really exciting to me. I'm so glad to be here. Awesome. I love it so much. Thank you, Lauren. I am looking for Maureen. Hello. In my best uh, Mrs. Doubtfire voice, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with you ladies as well. I am Maureen Scanlon. 
I am a certified life coach, relationship expert, uh, now newly podcast host and author. I have published two books that I took inspiration from my dogs. So it was a random thing, and I can't wait till we get into the whole writing process. It was just sort of that inspired writing, channeled writing. My dogs are everything, and they just taught me how to be a better person. So in my life coaching, I am a recovered, codependent, self-sabotager, and my dogs really taught me how to just live for today, be mindful, and be unconditionally loving. I live in very very hot phoenix arizona and so here we are we actually have our have humidity from you guys were borrowing it from florida sabrina and i were saying uh just for a couple months and then we're gonna give it back oh, so it. whether it's a dry heat or wet heat it's still heat and this subject is fun because i truly believe everyone can write a book there is no this is not old school, traditional, find a publisher, see if someone likes you and likes what you write. Like this is the cool age that we're in that you get to write what you think and you get to put it out there in the world, whether anybody wants to hear it or not. So I'm excited guys to get started on today's discussion. I love it. Can you tell us the name of your books? Because I just love the titles. <laughs> yes, book number one is my dog is more enlightened than I am. And book number two is my dog is my relationship coach. <laughs> I absolutely love it. So cool. Samantha, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and why this subject? Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. My pronouns are she, her. I'm tuning in from Southern California in LA. And I also have plenty of things that I call myself when I, it comes to what do I do. Um, primarily, I call myself a transformational tarot healer. And I also like to dive into DEI, so diversity, equity, inclusion, making an impact, creating community. Um, and I'm here to represent, um, hopefully there are some people here with me, um, those who have trouble honing in on what topic <laughs> will become the book because I feel like I get so inspired I start writing and then I have another idea. And so really just kind of honing in on that one idea um, that I can create into an entire book is kind of um, where I'm at on this journey. So I'm excited to be here. I love that. And I love that you're saying that because I feel like you're not the only one that does that. <laughs> um, I definitely have about 16 almost started books in my notes section of my phone, nonetheless. Um, so not at all put together. Um, and I'm here and was excited to bring Sierra on for my own greedy, selfish reasons, uh, because my I myself have a book that is um, done and, and halfway edited by somebody. Um, and when I say halfway, meaning it was edited once, which is not nearly enough times to be edited. But just, uh, you know, dealing with fear, dealing with, is it good enough? Dealing with, is it stupid? Um, you know, I read back through it sometimes that, you know, I'll dig it out. And sometimes I'll, you know, kind of glance it up like, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Oh my gosh, I'm brilliant. And then other times I read through it and I'm like, this is so dumb. This is just so dumb. So, um, so you know, dealing with my own fears uh, of what that is and what it means to be an author and what it means to like put a whole bunch of words together and have people read it and judge it. It's scary for me. So, um, so I'm kind of hoping, you know, through this process that I'll kind of get a little more information on that and um, jump over that fear because we all have fears. So uh, with that being said, I am going to hand the floor to Lauren for a question for Sierra. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I love the flower in your hair, Sierra. It like just makes the whole box so bright. I love it. <laughs> so lovely. Um, so like I said, I'm right at the beginning of my journey um, to writing a book. And, um, 
and so I guess my first question is, you know, I've done a lot of writing. I wrote a blog while while I was recovering from my accident. I um, I write every day on LinkedIn. I sometimes write a blog. Um, uh, I sometimes write blog posts like for my business. So writing comes so easily to me. But writing a book feels like, well, where do I start? Like I have this whole collection of stories, um, but I'd love to know what your advice is on where to start. Awesome. Okay. This is um, gonna be can, can, so I, can I can I can I say something? Yeah. Okay. So in the middle of answering Lauren's question, can you also go into your Maybe. ten hours of posting? <laughs> Or all so for those listening live yeah. already. <laughs> I will sprinkle things in You're when the guy. and where relevant. You're I already wrote down, oh, you know, half of the things that I want to say based on who's it. here, and we are gonna make the most of this. I so, love it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take us big picture for a second, and then Lauren, let's make sure I come back. If I don't seem like I'm coming back anytime soon, just be like but I think I can handle it. So I want everybody to take a deep breath, actually. And I want you to acknowledge one universal truth is that we cannot see ourselves accurately and we cannot fully understand the value of our lived and learned experience, because as soon as we know something, for the most part, we take it for granted. And we're like, oh, that's so obvious. Doesn't everybody know this? And so to, to address a couple different things, a lot of the fears that we have about sharing are, this is so, so obvious. Why am I gonna write this? Everybody knows this. No, they don't. And nobody knows it the way you know it. And somebody needs it the way you've experienced it and the way you're going to express it. But recognizing that we cannot see ourselves accurately leads me to, I say, we write for ourselves. This part of writing, I think of things and we teach things in several parts. There's the writing part, there's the editing part, publishing, and impact, which could be marketing it could be a lot of things but impact for me has a inherently positive connotation whereas marketing sometimes doesn't and i feel like i can get on board for impact and marketing makes me want to like crawl into a hole um maybe that's just me but we use because we're an all-female publishing company we've just gone all in right with this four-part creation process that works for the writing process. It works for the publishing process. It works for building and growing a business. It works for basically being human because this four part creation process echoes the seasons, the phases of the moon, the phases of life, your menstrual cycle, that these four elements are everywhere. Sort of the resting, the figuring it out, the listening, what's the What's that spark that's going to get planted in the spring and grow and flourish and then be harvested and hopefully enjoyed, right? So we do this four part creation process. It can be applied to anything and everything. And inside that four part creation process is the masculine energy and the feminine energy. And we go back and forth. We need the logistics of writing. How do you outline a book? How do you draft a chapter? How do you take a reader on a journey from here to here so that they're not bored, you know, and that they get value out of what it for it's taken you six, nine months, years to put into words. So that's the logistics. We support all of that categories and keywords and marketing strategies and all of that stuff. But then there's also, and this is the thing that I think is missing from most, I would say all, but I haven't checked them all, most publishing and writing services is the emotional part. All of the questions and the fears and the doubts and the vulnerability and the risk of showing up and being seen and becoming 
a leader, becoming an authority. I'm dyslexic so that I see words really differently. The word author is the first half of the word authority. And so when you become an author, you are inherently the authority. Okay, so let's come back. I'm gonna come back to parts of this sort of big picture, but let's come back to Lauren's question about sort of where do we start? And I think a lot of people have a common struggle with this. Either they're um, serial journalists, like journalers, and have a million thought books written on a bookshelf or in a drawer somewhere, or on the notes section of your phone or a blog that we create, we have things to say, but, and so that's, that's feminine, right? That is, that is lush, that is rich. What you need then is a container. That's all you need is decide the, the size and the shape of your container. And that's the masculine part. I just need an outline to hold my overflow. Otherwise I'm just pouring if it's a sieve or like it, you can write a million blogs and never write a book, or you can write 40 blogs and have your book done <laughs> depending on the container of your mind, but also the container, the energetic container that you've created for who's your audience. What's the transformation or the journey or the, the core that you want to offer others? Because when you know your audience, when you know where they are and what they're struggling with, chances are it's exactly what you were struggling with. And if you're not sure your audience, think about who you were back then, that's your audience. And you are already the expert on why that didn't work, right? And then where they want to be, which is where you are. And so get them from where you were to where you are in a way that's really accessible for them. I was on a training the other day. Uh, I have friends in books and writing, as you may imagine. And uh, I was sitting in on a ghostwriting training. And one thing that really struck me is in most stories, you're familiar with the hero's journey. You know, somebody has been invited and they're like, no, life is okay. I'm going to stick here. And then they're invited again, slash life collapses around them, aka an invitation that you cannot refuse, and then you go into the unknown. But in the unknown, you inherently always meet a mentor or a guide or someone who's going like, to give you a map through the crazy unknown that is ahead. And then you go and you face your demons and you come back. This is a super powerful um, template to use. If you can, there's like there's six to eight stops in the hero's journey. And if you can look at that and say, oh, I'm going to take my readers on the hero's journey because your reader now is the main character. We do nonfiction. Let me, let me back up. We only do nonfiction. Okay. Um, in nonfiction, especially for coaches, entrepreneurs, people are trying to add value and offer something to their readers. Your reader is your main character. And you're going to take them on a heroine's journey or a hero's journey. Okay. So if you know who they are, really dig into what are they struggling with? What's the problem that they cannot manage to solve? Walk them through it. Share your story by being so raw that you own the fact that you managed to break both of your shoulders chasing a vacuum because it it's got to take some serious conviction to your workaholism to do that. I don't even know how to do that. So you like celebrate your expert mess, right? I was so good at this. This is how I did it, right? And then literally draw, like I, I literally draw a map. I draw a map. These are the steps from where you are to where you want to go, where I was and where I am. A lot of people make the mistake of just talking to people at the end, only addressing people where they are now. And that doesn't do anybody any good because what does that, what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, 
this goes back to my first point. We don't, we can't see ourselves clearly. And so we forget all that we have managed to learn, accomplish and overcome. And, until, and unless we've got a really clear sense of where our audience is starting, what they still haven't managed to grapple with or understand or recognize or realize, then we're gonna be talking to them above their heads and they're not gonna get it and they're not gonna gain value and maybe they're gonna think we're assholes. I used to write from that place, okay? I used to write from, I've got it all sorted out, which is actually writing from a place of fear. <laughs> I wanna make sure I'm the expert, so I'm gonna sound like an asshole and I'm not gonna own any of the stuff along the way, but I also hadn't learned how much I'd learned. And so I, need, I needed that part of the journey. But you're, we write for ourselves the first time. We write to discover what we know. We write to discover how much we've accomplished. We write to discover our unique path or methodology or structure of our approach to things. And the editing and the publishing is where we make sure it serves somebody else. Because a journal is my interior blather. It's what's going on in my head. It's me digesting my current experience. I'm not going to publish it. I promise you, I will never publish my journal. Please don't. <laughs> right? That is the first round because that won't serve anybody. It's like the play by play of my life. Everybody's going through their daily experience. We don't need somebody else's daily experience regurgitated. We need the coalescing and the like, here's the big picture. I know where you are. Come, I have walked this path. Don't fall off the cliff over there. And oh, there's water three steps down. Don't worry, we'll get there. Like that allows someone the safety and the guidance to go on the journey. Not everybody needs to be your audience. Not everybody needs to be your audience. Don't write for everybody. That will paralyze you. You will never be done. So really get clear on who needs you. And Sabrina, with your permission, in a little while, I might guide us through a visualization that I do for sure. figuring that part out. Um, but clarify your audience. And I do a mind mapping exercise, Lauren, where I take the biggest paper, I kid you not, like the biggest paper I can find. I spread it out on the floor. I got lots of markers. I crank up the music. And in the center, I write a word or two. What is, what am I trying to do? Even if it's like my book. And then I draw lines and squiggles and all the ideas around my book. Like Sabrina and like almost everyone I've ever talked to, you're gonna discover that there's more than one there. There's probably eight, okay? There's this book, and there's this book, and there's this book, and there's this book, and Maureen's written two, and she's probably not done. And there's this book, and there's this book, and there's this book. Then when you, I did this with somebody a couple years ago. She's like, I can't get started. I can't get rolling. We did this exercise and she said, oh, there's 10 bucks. I said, yep, okay, cool. Now do the exercise again, just with one book, right? Put one topic at the center. What are the main things that if you had five minutes to say, the core lessons, the bullet points, put them around the main thing, and then branch out and blossom and flower and spread it out as far as you can go. Every sub idea and example and, oh, this makes me think of, and here's a lesson I teach to my coaches, and here's this, and here's that, and just go, okay? Because when you've done that, sometimes it takes 20 minutes, sometimes it takes two hours, but there's a very good chance that your book is sitting in front of you, almost already outlined. There's a really relatively simple exercise where you take a mind map and make a chronological outline. The mind map is feminine and it has no rules. It's colorful, it's chaotic. And then we make it masculine and make it chronological. Not chronological as you experienced it, but chronological for how will you walk someone else through what's all over the floor, right? That's the container. Because once you have an outline, 
every chapter is a blog and you know how to do that, right? There are useful chapter structures. You know, you start with a, a quote or a hook. You start with a little story and you like lay yourself bare at the beginning of every chapter so that nobody feels like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, oh, no, I'm an expert. You share either client stories or your own stories. You follow a similar format so that when somebody turns to the next chapter, they're like, oh yeah, I know, I don't know what's in here, but I know what the ride is gonna be like. I have a ticket, it's gonna be a roller coaster, I'm gonna get on, but it will end, right? Or what? we just need a cons and consistent structure. And then you actually have a book that needs to be edited, needs to be polished, needs somebody else to be like, yeah, you're on the right track, or what if we did this? But no one else can do this beginning part for you Ghostwriters can do this, but they spend hours digging into your brain, asking you all these questions. Here, like Maureen said, anybody can write a book. I have a lot of ghostwriting friends. I think it's a super valuable skill. I don't want to spend $15,000 to have somebody else write my book. I want to mind map it on the floor. I want to outline it. And then I want to write a chapter a day and have a book drafted. Um, does that answer your question ish? Okay. Yeah. Such great detail. And it, you really gave me like a framework because all the stories are already written in here Yep. and I'm a really fast writer. Um, uh, and I am, I, when you talk about the mind map, the chaos of it, like makes my heart pound. I like the masculine side. I like the putting things in order, the creating the structure. Um, and I know that there's a step before that for me for this. Yeah. So you really helped me see what is before order, which is where I lean. I always lean. So Chaos before order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you saying that Lauren, cause I actually kind of was like, cause I'm the same as you. Yeah. So it's interesting that the chaos is considered feminine. I don't know if I appreciate that very much because I can see myself <laughs> as very organized. It means it's free. It means it's loose. It means inspiration can come to you because there's the things you think you know in your head, but when you get there, something is going to come up that what didn't come this way. It's going to just, it's going to come. And you might see connections that don't seem logical, but once there's, I don't believe in chaos, chaos. I believe in like the chaos of the universe where if you look at the solar system, or the entire universe, it's a spiral. That's not chaotic. It's so flipping organized. It just, you just need the, to be in the right position to see the order. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so it's not derogatory at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's life. Okay. I, I, I see what you're saying. And I lived for so long in this like very corporate structure, workaholic, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I know for me, I've started practicing meditation in the last two years when I can get deep into meditation and get out of my head, I, ideas just come like yeah. floating in and it still remains a big challenge for me to just like let go of everything and let things happen. And it's something that I'm working on because I love it when I get into it, but I love structure too. And it's like my comfortable blanket is structure. <laughs> and there's no, one is not better than the other. Yeah. Masculine is not better than feminine. Chaos isn't better than order. They need each other. And so like this, I want you to think infinity loop. I want you to think the phases of the moon. That inspiration comes when we're not trying to make order, when we're not trying to figure it out and this is the new moon, this is the winter, the rest. This is when you're slow enough to hear the whisper that you didn't hear because you were trying to figure everything else out and zing, 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 right? Because the missing piece is probably the quiet one. It's the subtle one. If you clear two hours, which is masculine, creating time <laughs> is providing and protecting your dreams. Okay, awesome. I love providing and protecting. Create the container, create the time, create the space, right? Then 
oh, that's that's the container. Here's here's the time. Here's the edges of my paper. I'm safe. I can go, and anything can happen. And then you go back and make sense of that, and then then you write the shit out of it, and that's loose, right? Let the first draft, by definition, needs to be your worst draft. It needs to be a shitty draft. A lot of people get stuck. They're like, I, it's good in here, and it's not so good here. Let it be terrible. Let anything come out, because you certainly don't want your like third draft to, to be worse than your first draft. So you really, really, the goal is to write the worst draft possible. Ah, I love that. Lauren, <laughs> what was you? Lauren, what was your original question so we can make sure it's answered? Because I like oh, it's it's question. totally answered. It's where to start and okay. oh, yeah. beautiful, okay, so beautifully good. laid out, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. do that and then message me when you've gone chaotic and made an order and tell me how it feels. I love okay. it, Lauren. You're up. I mean, Marine. Sorry, Marine. You're up. I just wanted to add something to that as well. I wanted to add everyone is a different type of writer, just like we're all different types of speakers. And especially when it comes to nonfiction, some of us are going to be more clinical, more step oriented, more here's your instructions. Some of us are going to be more emotional about our story, the internal dialogue that was going on. So. Honestly, Lauren, I can just say when I started writing and I said I was going to write a book, I was told by my father, you don't know how to write a book. And I said, you're right, I don't, but I'm going to write some words on a piece of paper and we'll see what happens. And you know what I did? This is something everybody asked me. What do you do about writer's block? There's no reason to have writer's block. If you are trying to write something that you are not feeling, don't do it. Wait until you come back and, hey, I'm feeling like writing. What I did was, because the dogs were the subject of my book, Sierra, was I saw them do something, and I, I just observed. I was like observing my world, and I thought, gosh, you know, I struggle with this. And then I go, what do my dogs do about that? So I just wrote chapters. I just wrote 35 chapters. My dog did this today. Talk about fear. My dog did this today, talk about re how they relate to one another, how they shared their bone today. So there's no right or wrong way, Lauren, and don't overthink. I think that's what everybody thinks there's a certain way to do it. The only way is your way. So I'm gonna ask Sierra, this is something that, ev that was a big challenge for me that when I wanted to write the book, I had no idea what publishing entailed. You hear self-publishing, traditional, you get these checks and then you got to pay it back. And you know, how much freedom do I have? Do I have the right to my book? So what I did was I took webinars on publishing and there was full self-publishing, assisted self-publishing, and traditional publishing. Can you tell everyone the difference between them and what your company, um, where they fall into that? Yeah, and that's great because there is so much confusion around what these things are and which one's the right fit for you and which one's good and which one's just a total scam. And like some are, you know, oh, don't do that. You might as well like walk through the village square naked and covered in feathers. Don't do that. You know, there's some of that taboo stuff too. Um, I'm not going to be able to summarize all the webinars and all of the things because it is rather complicated. But for the longest time, before the internet, the way to get a book published was to go through a traditional publisher with a manuscript or at least a proposal. And everything's a business, right? The mit the traditional publisher will buy your manuscript. That means they own your content. They will buy it. So they'll give you some money for it. Everybody's like, oh, but I want that, right? You get money up front. But the reality is then, of course, that the publisher owns it. They will only buy it if they can sell it or they think they can sell it and make more than they paid for it and to produce it. <clears throat> That's traditional publishing, OK? You get royalties five, 10, 15% of the profit after you've earned back your initial uh, 
I just said the word and I blanked on it. For initial payment, right? I know a lot of people who have done this. Their book's been out for years. They've been hitting the pavement and they haven't made a penny past the initial payment. And it's hard because it's not theirs anymore because they sold it. The internet is awesome. Technology can be frustrating, but the internet is amazing and it has changed the game and allowed for there to be a lot of different options. So anyone, and I'm gonna agree with Maureen, anyone can write a book. Anyone, anyone, anyone can write a book and anyone can learn how to publish a book all by yourself. So that's the, the sort of the opposite to traditional publishing came about before Amazon, but Amazon and Ingram and a couple of other really big platforms made it easy for people, sort of open source, let's let your voice out into the world. You can read some books, you can, and I did, okay? My first two books, full disclosure, my first two books, How Change Really Happens and Date Yourself. This one I wrote and learned how to publish in three months. I put myself, I was like, this is all I'm gonna do, and write this tiny little thing and put it out into the world. It's really good. The shorter sometimes is better. You don't have to like, a lot of women come and they're like, shouldn't it be 238 pages for it to be respectable? I was like, I don't have time to read 238 pages. Do you? Your, do your audience, does your audience need to wait six more months for you to write that book? Or should you write half of that book and get it out now so you can start helping people, <laughs> right? So it doesn't, there's a lot of these like roadblocks, mental roadblocks in our head about storytelling and publishing. Second book, also self-published, um, learned a lot. Because I learned a lot, I was like, ooh, anyone can learn how to do this. What we do is try to accelerate that process. We've gathered a lot of the tools. We do some a lot of it for you. And so that somebody doesn't have to quit their job and study how to do this for six months um, and get a book out relatively quickly. We fall in between completely self-publishing, learning how to do it on your own, doing it all on your own, hiring the editor, hiring the cover designer, hiring the formatter, or buying the software and learning how to do it yourself and selling your manuscript to a reputable place. I'm not trying to knock either method because I think they're all good. And like every story needs to be told, I think right now there's enough publishing options for every story that will get told. I don't think that was true 100 years ago or 30, okay? A lot of stories never got told. Now the stories can get told the same way somebody needs your version, okay? They need your version. Even if there's three books just like yours, they need your version. I'm gonna brag just for a second because I think it's good practice. How Change Really Happens. A lot, uh, you read the reviews on Amazon, people were like, there's nothing new here, but it's presented in a way that I actually finally get it. Okay, awesome, I'll take it. That was well worth it, I am happy to do that. I didn't reinvent the wheel, but if I could write something in a way that somebody else could understand, I did my job. And so the same, what I'm trying to say is that there's a, a kind of publishing that's gonna fit each aspiring author the same way your book, your story, has somebody who's out there right now waiting for it. So Sabrina, this is the exercise that I do. Can we take two minutes? I want everybody to close their eyes, okay? And I want you to, again, take a deep breath. Slow down enough to really tune in with the gifts you have to share with the world. What is it that either is just burning a hole in your belly that you wanna get out in the world, or you know that you have something special to offer. So you tune into that. And let it fill your body. And now I want you to become aware of the people on the planet in this moment who need what you've got who are looking for what you've figured out, who are struggling with what you were struggling with and haven't, haven't managed to make that shift. 
And every time I do this, I see the whole globe and I, each one of these people lights up like a little firefly. So I want you to see the globe and feel these people and where they are. They're, they're looking, but they haven't found you yet. And connecting you from your belly, your solar plexus, with each one of these people, with each one of these firefly lights, is a red thread. Because you're already connected to them. You're already energetically and karmically linked. You have the key for them. And so let that really settle in. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes, you can gather up all those red threads and those connections, but I want you to remain aware of the people who need you. For me and for our authors, this is the fuel that gets us through the, I'm too tired and I'm really scared. And what if nobody needs me? And what if it's already been said already? And you know, all of that. We connect with who needs us so that we can show up and do the hard thing because it's totally terrifying. All sorts of parts of this are totally terrifying. We, to answer uh, Maureen's question, we offer a lot of author services. The writing part, no publisher I've ever seen has writing coaching. We have a weekly writers community. It's actually free the whole month of August, so I'd love to share that with the community if I may later. Um, weekly month, like weekly writers coaching, where we walk through the four parts of the writing process, the publishing process, the impact process. So we support that because we can't publish anything if you can't write it. If it's still in your head, Lauren, you can't like shake your head over your computer and hand it to me and have me publish that. I can't do that. I know. I wish if you just hit it hard enough, something might come out. It doesn't work, you, right? You've got to have the support, like Maureen said, to, to write it your way, yeah? With your schedule and your style and your sass and your insight and your clinical, you know, footnotes, whatever because it's about you and your audience, because that red thread, I can't do that. I can't do that for you. I can create that space for you and I can hold you and guide you, but no one's got what you got, right? Um, so we looked at this whole big picture. Nobody's helping the writers. And then there's a lot in the publishing process that needs support and navigating and a team really there's eight people on our team. Somebody's an expert in formatting. Somebody's an expert in cover design. Somebody's an expert in punctuation. God help us. People will say, oh, so you're the editor? I'm like, oh, honey bear, I hope not. I'm dyslexic. I don't care if it's a colon, a semicolon, a comma. You know, no, I'm not the editor. We all open any book on your bookshelf. Count how many people are acknowledged and thanked and part of the team that made that book like 36 usually or more. It's huge. No one author name goes on the book. No one's an author all by themselves. You need a team. Um, but then our particular niche is really supporting women to write those stories that are going to change people's lives. And how do you support them after that? Because I do say this on every call and every conversation. You're probably not going to make the money you want or deserve from book sales alone. I'd love for you to, but we're not going to count on it. And we're going to build in some safety nets so that you have some services that people can, you know, you get to the back, the last page of a book and you feel like the author broke up with you because there's nothing else. No, we're not going to break up with all of those little fireflies who need more than the book can offer the book should serve those people. It should move them forward. It should offer value. We're not writing just a fancy lead magnet book to boost our esteem and whatever, and then really hard sell somebody. Uh -uh. The book has value and it can change someone's life. If somebody wants more and needs more, our authors 
have built systems in place so that we can support people more. Join me for this retreat. Come to my mastermind. Here's my thing. Each person sort of has their thing figured out. And that's where you can actually earn a living because you are an author. The author makes you an expert, creates that visibility. It opens stages, it opens doors. It is a lead magnet, but I don't want it to be just a lead magnet. And so all those pieces we bring together so that we can take somebody all the way. Um, something else I was going to say, but I, I lost it in there somewhere. But I want you to hang on to who needs your story and show up for them. I love that. Um, uh, Sam. Oh my goodness. Um, going, <laughs> going after the first two questions, I feel like there's just been so much amazing information that I'm kind of just doing. And what do I actually want to ask after hearing all of that guidance and all of that advice so far? Um, I feel like something that stuck out to me is I know I resonated very much so when you were kind of describing the feminine versus the masculine. And when I think about myself, I feel like I'm very attuned to the feminine in terms of those ideas and the inspiration is constantly flowing. And I have the masculine where I can be very structured and I'm good with structure. But I think it's that integration part of the two that I get a little bit lost. And also balancing between what I feel called and inspired to write and the audience and what they are also seeking and kind of finding that balance. Yeah, awesome. Um, so the implied question is, how do you do both? Yes, yep. bridge everything together. Awesome. Um, I struggled with this myself. The first time I sat down to write a book was 2006, OK? And I was good. I was dedicated. I cleared my schedule. It also helped that I was unemployed. And I wrote from the moment I woke up until noon every day. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. Um, and then one day, I guess I just sort of stopped. And that two thirds of a manuscript is still on a hard drive somewhere and it never came to life. And then there's times where I would outline and get all masculine and get, but I didn't have the spark. I didn't have that inspiration. Okay. I was trying to force, force it. And Maureen mentioned writer's block. That's when you're trying to make something that isn't, that's one and not the other. Inspiration's coming and there's no container, or you're like, I'm going to do it no matter what. And, you know, but I, and you just like stare at a blank page, right? This is where the turning point for me was when I clicked into those four phases. Okay. really digging in to, so when we talk about them, we really talk about them in terms of the faces of the moon, because if you're not sure, you can look at the sky. <laughs> look at the sky tonight and be like, oh, right. That does not mean your creative energy must match the moon's flow or even your menstrual cycle. But these are just really visible reminders that we're in flux and that we're changing. And so what we teach is to practice these four phases, acknowledging these phases, trying them on, seeing what they feel like and taste like to each of us. Because my experience of resting or inspiration is gonna be genuinely different than yours. I use the word rest and I recognize that that even word doesn't really match everybody. So think new moon, think what do you need to be able to hear the inspirational spark? Because some women in our community go for a run to rest. And that is the absolute opposite of what I think of resting looks like for me. So I'm not gonna tell people to stop running, but you need to know where that calm, re regenerative space comes from. What does it look like? What does it feel like? And genuinely, sort of when do you need it? Do you want a whole week of it? Do you need a day of it? Do you need an hour of it? Do you need three minutes of it? You can go through all four of these phases in a single day. You can take 10 minutes when you wake up. 
You can spend a whole week. I don't care. You can spend three months. It's called winter, right? Like, go. The first phase is what we call rest or dreaming. So you're like listening to the whispers. The second phase, Sabrina, Lauren, you are going to love this. It's the planning. Okay. This is planning in terms of outlining. This is planning in terms of when am I actually going to sit down and write? But that's not sitting down and writing. It's just looking at your calendar and saying, oh, every Tuesday I have a three hour break. I'm gonna guard that time so I do it. Or most of the books that I read on writing, and uh, this is why it's important I think for women to be talking about this, most of the books I read on writing were written by men and they said, Oh, just sit down and do an hour every day until you're done. And Liz Gilbert says the same thing. Love her. Doesn't mean it has to be that way. If it doesn't work for your schedule, it doesn't mean you're never going to write a book. Find the system that works for you. There was a while where I'd wake up at two o'clock in the morning and write for three hours. Okay, that was my writing time. It wasn't ideal, but guess what? I woke up every time, every time naturally. And instead of beating my head against the wall, being like, why am I not asleep? I just wrote. Um, and so I stopped resisting that natural flow and acknowledged that it was actually sort of a gift. It is the witching hour. It's really quiet. There's no distractions. My daughter's asleep. My dog's unconscious. Everything's beautiful. So just take it where you can take it. So the dreaming phase, the planning phase, then to just do it, the write it, the shitty first draft, let it pour out channel it. I don't care where you are. Um, one tip that changed my life. Otter is a voice to text app that works really, really well. And it punctuates your words. I used to do voice to text in like Google and that kind of thing. But then I spent so much time trying to figure out what it was that I had said, it was useless. So you can get it for free. It's fantastic. And you I wrote a lot walking my dog, going out for coffee, and I also stopped being an asshole because I don't, correct me if I'm wrong or you disagree, I'll, I'll drop the, uh, the link in a minute, yeah, um, Otter. Um, I can just talk and it free flows, it's natural, it seems, people would read my book and comment, it seems like I'm having a conversation with the author, yeah, you are because I'm talking to you. Because when I sit down and I start to type, I get really pedantic. I'm like, well, I'm supposed to be smart now. I'm and I am sort of get this vision of like a European professor, you know, corduroy jacket, leather patches, pipe, asshole. And I write from that space. But when I'm talking, I'm not that person. I'm this person. And that really was helpful. So the writing, whatever Method, that works for me. It works for a lot of people to get them out of their head. But if it doesn't work for you and you want a pen and paper in the park where there's no Wi-Fi, go for it. Whatever your streaming, get your story out, but get it out shitty, raw, loose, because the final phase is the revision, the polishing, the taking what's come out, and making something with it. I am, um, I've been accused of abusing metaphors and I use them all the time. One of the examples of this is like making bread, okay? You need to be hungry. <laughs> that's the first part. And then you get the recipe and you gather the ingredients and that's the planning part. Then you mix it all together in a goopy dough, okay? But so many of us think that writing, first of all, we think that writing is just that part and we forget the dreaming and the planning and we forget the editing. And so it changes our relationship with this writing. We also think that this dough should be edible. And you're not gonna spread butter or jam on raw bread dough. You must bake it. You must let it sit and rise and put it in the oven. And that's the editing, the polishing, the revising phase. Because then when you take the bread out, it's flipping delicious, fresh out of the oven, melted butter or jam or honey, whatever, and it's good. And people will eat it up. 
but your first version does not need to be edible. Okay. Um, Sam, does that help? I danced all over, but. Yes, um, and then I think the second part was just um, kind of deciphering and balancing what the audience are looking for, or maybe what other people have told me that I would be great um, at speaking on mm -hmm. uh, versus what I also feel called to write about. Yep, um, I think it's really important to, to be aware of what other people think you should do and not give it too much credibility unless it also lights you up. I found a really clear indication of when I'm onto something or even when one of my authors is onto something and my skin tingles, I'm, that's that. Pay attention to that, right? But if somebody's like, oh, you should really write about the, the microeconomics of the ancient civilization of this place, and you're like, yeah, I know a lot about it, but I couldn't care less. That's not what you should be like. That's what they want from you, but it doesn't, if you don't love it while you're doing it, they're not gonna love what's left, you know? I'm sorry. So li listen and, and go back and do that visualization as many times as you want and listen to that because those people who do need you, they're actually walking around somewhere today, right now. And we are connected with them. So we can do like energetic market research and just be like, what do you need? What's the story you need me to tell? Because I'm here, I will show up, I will walk through fire for you, just, you know, and that'll let that inspiration be the thing. Um, this is another element, we create community. Our authors know each other, they talk to one another so that you're not the only one and you're not having to figure out, am I on the right track? Is this any good? Right, Sabrina, your, your fears were as, like, is this good enough? Or is this as good as I think it is? <laughs> let somebody else in from time to time. Don't let everybody, don't post it on the internet. Um, one of my mentors, trained that taught me this concept of contained exposure. When you're in the beginning of a process, you have a new idea. I want you to guard it like a fragile little being and only share it with really special people who get you, who appreciate what you're trying to do in the world. And you share it with them when you're ready. Because if you put out a tiny little sprout, I don't know if you've ever seen like a small seed when it opens up and it puts it's got the most fragile little root. If you put it in the sun or you put it on the sidewalk, it's going to be dead before it has a chance. So I want, once you have this spark, this dream, this desire, let it grow deep roots. Let it grow a strong foundation so that someday somebody hears it and sees it and they're like, oh, I don't think you should write about that. Oh, I wish you hadn't told that story. Uh, mm, sure, you want to do that, but you're not just you're not crushed by that. Whether they're you know whether that's their own fear because they've always wanted to write a book and they never did, or whether they're trying to keep you safe from some projected disappointment that they think you're gonna have it doesn't actually matter. Guard your babies until they're strong enough to withstand a storm, but. Let those babies be yours. You don't have to go and adopt somebody else's seeds and make them yours. Because you won't have, you won't have enough energy probably to take it all the way. And it won't be any fun. Uh, Maureen had her hand up. Yep. Um, I was just gonna say, you know, this one, I literally wrote this in eight weeks from the time I wrote it till I published it eight weeks. And like Sierra said, it doesn't have to be a long one. So my first one was only, oh my goodness, 125 pages, right? My next one, and I'm not trying to be, you know, free promo here, but, um, but actually I yeah, am. Yeah. <laughs> um, You're here to talk about it, your book. 
It's super and this fun. this one I wrote during um, the pandemic, and it did took it took months and months, and you know I finally the year after the pandemic I released it, but I want to say this, you guys, the the biggest thing was turning a I should write a book, I have to write a book, I ought to write a book into. I want to write a book. I want to help the world and I need to get this message out really changes the, the inspiration for your book. If you look at it in that way, uh, honestly, every day I would just wake up, just like Sierra said, the writing in the middle of the night. If I woke up and I was like, Ooh, Ooh, I have this idea. I have to go do this. If I woke up in the morning, there were weeks where I said, yeah, no, I'm not in the headspace. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I'd have 10 different chapters and I'd say, oh, I need to get up and write. It is a flow. It is an absolute flow. And if you ever run into a writer's block and you're frustrated, then you're not in the place. You're in a resistance and nothing ever comes to us when we have resistance. That's a law of attraction. You have to remove all that resistance you know, for that to come. And what's funny is when I wrote, when I wrote it and then read it later, I was reading it and I went, Hey, this is really good. This is really good. Like I didn't realize how good it was because as I was writing it, it was completely inspired writing and you could tell I was in the flow and you'll do that when you'll do your best work when you're just in a flow and it's just coming out of your mind. It really is a, it's a fun process, but always be in joy when you're doing it. That is really all I can. That's the best advice. Everyone always asks me, you know, how was the process or how easy was it? And I said, well, it's as easy as when you feel it, you write, when you don't feel it, don't write. That was it. So I just wanted to throw that in there. The, the thought of, I need to do this. I want to be an authoritarian or authority on this thing. Um, I need to make sure, you know, when you're forcing anything, um, it's never good. If it's coming from a place of where your heart is, where your mind is, where your message is, it's easy. Sabrina, I know you've got books in you and I know it'll come from this place of just, just write it down. Don't overthink the process or the subject for that matter, just write, just write. And you'll start seeing a theme of yeah. what's most important and what you're passionate about and where your knowledge is. Yeah. So are you self-published or did you, how did you? So mine, mine was in between full self-publishing and traditional. So it's assisted publishing, self-publishing. And uh, my publisher is Outskirts Press. And what was really nice for me is it was a package deal. And having that package was so much easier for me. I don't like uh, logistics. I don't like details. I'm not that girl. I don't like the editing. I don't like hiring individual people. It was nice. It had a package just for me. But like Sierra said, different publishing companies offer different packages, small to large, cost low to high. So whatever fits for you, just find your fit. I love that. Um, Sierra, I wanted to ask about this whole moon thing. I'm not a moon person. Why do you yeah. keep talking about the moon? So I was born in a cabin in the woods. Okay. And the, the seasons in Vermont are really intense and really clear. And humans have lived in and with these cycles and seasons for millennia with the internet the electric light and just working 24 7 we are pretending that this universal law that affects everything doesn't affect us and that we don't need rest and that we don't need play that we don't need celebration and that's actually, so this is what my first book is about, how change really happens. We think it should, progress should be 45 degrees, linear, let's go, smash it out. If you're not like doing a 49 degrees, you're probably slacking, you're probably gonna die alone and no one's gonna love you. So, but what clicked for me and what 
got me out of workaholism and a lot of self-doubt was cyclical shifts, right? How do you spell that? Spell what? Cyclical. Cyclical. See, you're asking a dyslexic to spell. Um, (laughs) By the way, dyslexia is like the worst word to spell. But um, cyclical, C-Y-C-L. A, I don't know. A, A, I don't know. Okay, go ahead. It's cyclical. Okay, cycle. This was cycle. That, so I'm just going to speak personally. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Lauren. God bless you both. Um, I was trying to be successful in a model that didn't fit me a constant, continual, I think of it as masculine, this whole cycle has really shifted and allowed for me to not always be at the top of my game, always be performing at 100% or 110%. And it allows for shit to fall apart. And it's actually in those phases that I find the best learning, growing, changing, Somebody says, oh, I'm going through such a hard time. I'm like, congratulations. That's really exciting. Good for you. We think that we should only be in the light. We should be full moon, full summer, all the time. I use, it's just a metaphor. I'm using it as a metaphor, the moon, phases of the moon, reminding us that we do not have to be constant anything. Does that make sense, Sabrina? You don't. You don't have to love it. It doesn't have to be yours. But in the creation process. It made my stomach hurt when you said it. Okay. Well, then it's probably not the right thing for you. (laughs) Just because I don't really understand it. it, Like all of a sudden added this extra layer of like, wait, I can only write when. No, no, no. And how. No, 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 it's not. You don't have to. That's what it felt like. It's like. It's a I've never even paid attention to the moon ever. Like I don't even ever look at the moon unless somebody says, look at the moon. And then I'm like, oh, now I will look at the moon. And you can't look at the moon when you can't see it, which is actually the part that I think is the most important is the, so let's pull back and just say, we said it earlier, is that when we're talking about writing, most people think about the act of writing, but what doesn't get attended to a lot is the pre-writing, the figuring out who you're writing for and what lights you up and how you're going to do it so that you can do it with ease so that you can do it with joy not so that there's some you know dogma that you have to follow and it definitely isn't oh well it's the full moon so i need to write my pages now we don't need any more of that like imposing this is how you're supposed to do it i get it so exactly how i felt is exactly what you were trying to say not to do yeah But we're so used to, we are so used to hearing there's a right way. Let me try to force myself into the right way. Mm -hmm. And I do, I will say, and I say to all of our authors, because I made the mistake, I, I mean, I agree with Maureen in almost everything she said, but I have several books that I just wrote, but never finished because I didn't have the big picture. I didn't have the vision of the audience. I didn't know what the end was. And so from when I first sat down to write a book and when I actually sat down and wrote this book, 10 years went by. 10, no, 12. Okay. And so structures, not one, my structure has to be the right structure, but structures can accelerate the process. Every single person can write a book. People ask me all the time, who should be writing a book? And I say, well, anybody who fucking wants to write a book should write a book, and they can. The only people who shouldn't are the people who don't want to, (laughs) right? Lauren, what do you got? Um. I, uh, Sabrina, I totally identify with when you say like, it makes my stomach hurt. You and I are so soul sisters. Um, but I, so I used to function in a way that was like, I was either full moon or 
the moon fell out of the sky and I was broken. Burnout. Yeah. Um, yeah. Burnout. Right. I mean, what a beautiful metaphor for burnout, the actual moon falling out of the sky. Um, and I spend a lot of time now in this really icky for me place, which is like, I'm just chilling <laughs> and I don't know how to do it. And I know like every time I'm doing it, I'm like, this is wrong. I should be doing more or I should be sleeping. Like there's, you know, like I don't, I still am working through and my life is so much more fulfilling now than it ever has been. And I work like 40 ish hours a week, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less where I was working like up to a hundred hours a week. And every time I'm not doing something that is like work productive, I feel like I'm doing it wrong. And I, I logically know I'm not. And like, sometimes my cycles are like, I just need like 10 minutes over here and then I'm going to get back to work. Um, and sometimes like in early this year, I took two months off, which I've never done in my whole life. And uh, the first thing I did was clean my 96 inch window, wide window blinds with yep. Clorox wipes because I didn't know what to do with myself. It didn't make a difference, by the way, your, your blinds don't need that. Um, but I get that, Sabrina. And I think that's part of my struggle with writing this book is that um, I do need the outline. Like I haven't, I have stories tucked away in all different places and some of them I'll pull in, like they're already written and I'll pull in. But not having this outline makes me feel like um, I'm doing nothing. And then I, I sort of feel like once I write the outline, like I'm just going to go. I'm just going to like write for however many weeks straight it takes until I'm done. And that's the like perfectionist inside of me who just thinks like, if I'm going to do it, I may as well just do the whole thing. So this moon cycle talk is making me both uncomfortable and also like really interested. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that might so I do this very often and it, and some people probably freak out about it and some people love it most people sort of love it what day do you want your book to come out this is a question for everybody when do you want your book to come out I had a date actually I really did I bet yeah. you I could find it but then I got scared right Okay, yeah. because so we're creating this. The but I did it real fast. Like I probably I broke basically I broke my leg in October 2020, mm -hmm. and I said I had to stop everything. Um, well, first of all, the pandemic changed my whole business yeah. in general, and then also October, a few months later, once I started doing the whole online thing, my whole life stopped. So I was like, this is the universe telling me to finally just sit the f down calm down sabrina and write a book because i've been wanting to write a book for so long so i was like i can't ever stop working like i'm always freaking doing something doesn't matter what nothing's stopping me so i'm like, guess i'm writing a book so i literally wrote this crazy long like 272 page book um real fast like in three happen. weeks in three yeah. weeks or something i'm like yeah. half the time on medication and got it edited like i was like boom 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 got it edited and then got scared and then that's it it's just been sitting there since like december 2020. well and so this is you and i are gonna have another conversation Sorry, Sam, I know very, very specifically we're gonna have another conversation about what the next stages are and we can open up because i know we have a little bit of time we've talked a lot about the writing process we haven't talked a lot about the publishing timeline and so we can make some time for that because I think it's important. Um, does everybody, but even just spit out a number, a date. Three to Oh, nine actually, months. oh, you want us to actually to, say a number? For, for each of you, absolutely, straight up. Three to nine, three to 12 months from today. Um, I'm gonna say October 15th. Okay. Next. Lauren, Sam, you know your life, you know your cycle, you know 
maybe your launches, whatever, whatever. When is a good time? When is a reasonable time where you're not going to give yourself an autoimmune disease, but you're also going to get it done? Ah! I said mine. So oh, I've already done that. Yeah. <laughs> Check. Next. Check. I feel when I'm inspired, just like Sabrina said, I can just crank things out pretty quickly. Um, so I feel like I would be able to do it this year, um, maybe like November 11th. <laughs> yeah, that's a good day. It's a Friday. We got a, a book coming out on that day. 11-11-2022. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love oh, that. Good, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we can tell Sam's all aligned with the moon for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, what feels? What feels? Um, well, my book will be written by the end of the year. Yeah. Um, I sort of imagined it coming out in May and mm -hmm. I don't have a specific date. I love double numbers. So maybe the 11th or the 22nd, but I, um, I pictured it coming out. My, I think my audience is like book club women, you know, uh, professional women who, who hang out together and May feels like this sort of lull where it's like right before the summer and kids are the crazy, you know, all that. And Early the school May, yeah. The second half of May. Yeah, May is sort of feels like my sweet spot. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So if you, th this is one of these exercises. It's so simple. You each have a publishing date. So what happens in my head and we have a, like a spreadsheet which some people love and other people hate, but it's, here's your publishing date. Here's how much time before that. And here's when you need to have a rough draft. And here's when you have your outline and here's, you know, and everything's just back planned. So, and having that structure, Sabrina, keeps the momentum of, I've written the manuscript and now there's another thing to do. The next part of the publishing is how, I had a revelation because I have, I'm just going to admit my own sort of anti-marketing grounding. I'm like, Bleh, sounds awful. But for me, shifting marketing into getting my book or your book into the hands of the people who need it, I'm all for that. And taking time to have a strategy and all the content and all the everything in place so that your book not only comes out, but it comes out with a bang and it gets into the hands of the people who need it. And so that the, the momentum that you've poured into the manuscript, that you've poured into getting it into the hands of the people who need it, keeps going. We often think, and this may make your stomach hurt. Okay, I'm okay, I'm happy to hear. I'm happy to be here to like upset you a little bit if it propels you forward. Absolutely. Oh, um, when women sign with us, I'm like, okay, so you're freaking out now because you just signed a publishing contract. I'm pretty much promising you eight to 12 more panic attacks. They're on schedule and I can sort of tell you when they're coming. You need them to move through to be the person that is gonna be that published author. Let's go. They're not signs that you're doing anything wrong. They're signs that you're growing. Um, but we think of books like babies. When you're pregnant, when the baby is born and when the book is in the world and it has a life of its own. So we want to make sure that it has its own life cycle so that it can stand on its own two feet so that it can be read. Some of my books work out two years ago, three years ago, people are still buying them. I'm going to be straight up with you. I have zero marketing energy. I don't market it at all. People are still buying it and reading it and reviewing it. Effing great. Love it. Okay. Because we've set the momentum, now it's alive and it can go play on its own. Go play with your friends, right? Love you. Bye. Okay. Because you get it into the world and then it's taking care of the people who need it. And you don't have to walk it around. In the beginning you do, but having some structures in place so that, because I, I made all these mistakes, every single one of these mistakes I made, I wrote a book and I didn't have a publishing date or an audience in mind. I didn't know why I was writing a book, so I never finished it. I didn't have anybody who was holding me accountable to taking it to the next level. My fear went out, my doubt went out. 
got a crush on a boy and I went to South America and I never finished my book. Still in South America, no book, right? Took me 10 years to put all of those pieces together when it could really just take like four months or six months. And so I think that's the difference. Again, anyone can write a book. We want to accelerate your process. Sam, you had a question and thank you so much for your patience. Yeah, I think that this has to do kind of with the timeline, which is how do we know once we've kind of written and gotten things out, when it's then ready to go to that next step of the editor? Um, yeah. like, is it just a feeling like, you know, okay, it's ready um, versus when you go back and then you just start making changes to everything? <laughs> no, it's probably never going to feel like it's ready. But in that again, permission to use this sort of baby metaphor, when it's howling and screaming and you don't ever want to look at it again and you really need to hand it off to somebody else before you kill it, that's when it's ready for an editor. Totally. There's two different kinds of editors also. There's developmental editing that like big picture, okay, here's the reader's journey. You've got all those pieces. There's consistency of tone, this, that, and the other. Or like you sort of lost me here, or I don't get this. Big picture editing is really important. And then there should be another time where you sort of wrestle with it, but you've you know had a, a, a kid-free night or month, you get it back and you're like, okay, now I can dive back in. Now I can like take this to the next level. We then have professional proof editing and copy editing to make sure that you're commas are in the right place and that each word is the the best word for the meaning that you're trying to make and somebody else who gets language better than you different than you makes your manuscript tighter the job of a good editor is actually to maintain your voice and your message while making it even stronger and clearer for the reader and we say all the time that if a publisher is doing their job right no one will ever notice because the reader won't ever pop out of the reader experience and be like, that's awkward phrasing. That should have been edited differently. <laughs> or that's a run on. Like, if you pop out, then, then we've missed something. But the whole point is that they get into a flow with you and then they have an experience, right? It's like being at a movie theater and having some, somebody behind you like pick up their cell phone. You're like, oh my God, I'm in a movie theater. You thought you were in the scene. We don't want that to happen. Um, and so the editor's developmental edit helps with the big picture. And then the proof copy sort of makes it final. We never, this is another sort of quote that I picked up somewhere along the, the way. And it was from a university professor. Your essay will never be done. It's due, but it'll never be done because you can always make it better. You can always tweak it. You can always change it. But this is where we go back to those little fireflies. They need it now. It, yeah, if you wait a year, you're gonna have learned more and you can share more, but they need it now. And guess what? You should just write another book for next year, right? Lauren, if you do your mind map and you have a couple of different book ideas, just a series of books is a great sort of marketing strategy because people will read one and then they'll want to read another and another. So if you stumble on, there's a couple things here. I don't know which one to choose. Just choose one and know that it can be part of the series. I actually love that for sure. Um, Sydney is asking, will this live be saved? Yes, it'll be live on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and it'll be there forever. Yay. Um, I like the idea of a series of a book. Uh, for sure. It's interesting that you said that because I just noticed I just bought a book on Amazon. And one of the things that I specifically noticed is in on the cover of the book, it said um, something one. Mm -hmm. What would that be like? It doesn't say book, series. Book one. Book one. Maybe it said book one. Yep. Uh, but I thought it was interesting because he's only he's only written one book. But he knows he's writing more. Yeah, and I actually acknowledge that. I'm like, oh my gosh, because I went online. I'm like, there's more of these. Yep. There's no more. 
Not yet. But he already preemptively knew yep. he's so he's got a series coming out. I thought he's it so was he's it's already. not a it's not a fantasy. It's like a self help yeah. type book. Yeah, um, that's all I read. <laughs> but uh, I thought that that was cool. I like that you said that. And I just noticed that literally a couple weeks ago with the book that I'm reading right now. I want to sprinkle in a, another idea um, for maybe more for people who are listening but not in this room with us. There's more than one way to write a book and to become a published author. One, so the very first time, let me show you, it's here somewhere. The very first time I became a published author, I wrote a short story in an anthology, it's five pages long became a published author by writing something really small. And I learned a lot on the logistic sense, and I had the transformation on the emotional and personal sense that allowed for me to move forward and be like, oh, wait, I can do this. I can write a chapter. Guess what? I can do that 13 times. I wrote a book, <laughs> right? And so something that Red Thread's been doing, we've been putting out collaborative books. Everybody writes a chapter. It's a beautiful thing because you're with a cohort, you're on a theme. We talk about how do you connect with your audience? How can writing a chapter actually be lead generating while you're offering value to your reader? And then there's 20 people helping you market the book because each of those authors is sharing the book with their audience. And so you're not the only person raising this baby, okay? Somebody in our community unboxed 150 copies of this book today. 150 copies. So she's going to take care of wherever neighborhood in California she's in. She's got it. Totally taken care of. There's 100 cop 150 copies there. And so when you're doing things together, it's actually easier and more fun. Some of our authors. So I have, if you go to Amazon and you look up Sierra Melker, I think there's 10 books. I've solo written two, but I have 10 books to my name because I work in collaboration. And when you write a chapter in a collaborative book, not only are you an author and you have another title to your name and you're reaching an audience, you're also being handed to the audiences of all your co-authors. There's 150 people who are going to read other chapters because this one author took a book that has a chapter for me. And so it's working together. Again, one of these ideas of like, I have to do it all by myself in order to have it be valuable. Does anyone resonate with that sort of myth? <laughs> I have to write a solo book and I have to do it all by myself because if I ask for help, it doesn't count. Yeah, I could say that. I think that's with a lot of things. That's not just writing a book. That's it, with it's a, a lot it's of all, things. It's all things. Yeah. But it, it's one of these. I even sometimes things. find myself not asking for help because I don't want to give credit to anybody else. <laughs> just being honest. Just being, but, then that, it, yeah. but then that hurts me in the long run. Yeah, it hurts me. In what the if long you run. could get everything that you wanted just by asking two people to help you? Hey, yeah. do you have anyone else I can talk to about this? Yeah. Done. Sorted. Right? And so, so I think it's fun. It's, we, it's, it's different, but it's, I just wanted to put that out there um, because some people are like, oh, I've never even considered. Yeah, to have I no agree. Idea. I actually like that you're saying that here too, because even just within this Her Version community, I know there's hundreds of women who um, have similar backgrounds or thoughts or uh topics niches yeah where they could kind of um cluster together yeah yeah that's interesting definitely yeah. and writing a chapter newsflash writing a chapter is easier than writing a book you can write a chapter in a weekend yeah right and so it's easier it gets you in front of more people it counts just as just the same as anything else just as a full regular book and it can be a little bit more fun. You can make a friend. So um, uh, I'm completely converted to collaborative author books. What do you do as far as the writing style of everyone being so different? We, so anyone who's doing a collaborative author book with us gets into writer's circle. We have 
we encourage beta readers. So read each other's chapters. We talk about, there's, we're not gonna say, you have to do it this way. Again, that's dogmatic and it's structure and we don't do that. It's actually falls mostly on the editors to figure out not only how do we capture the voice, but what order do we then put these stories? Because all we do is say, here's, here's the, top, the title and the subtitle of the book, knock yourself out, okay? Sanctuary, cultivating safe space and sisterhood, rediscovering the power that unites us. Write about that and what that means to you. And then we trust and we let it go. But what happens? Wow, that's really scary. That's that, terrifying. That, that's interesting because I actually saw that when you and I first met. I think you were yeah. just, you were like looking for like one or two more people or something. Yeah. yeah and you it. sent me the instructions and I read it and I was like, yeah, this is not enough information for me. I didn't feel comfortable um, yeah. in that in that space, but I get it. And I actually do, I'm actually kind of relating this to my impact panels. So I get that with my impact panels a lot, when people sign up for them, there's literally just one sentence. Right. Just like, it's a whole freaking topic. And people will email me and they'll be like, I'm interested, but like, what exactly? And I'm like, there is no exactly, just whatever the frick you want it to be. Well, um, and that's magic. So very right? much the same. I appreciate that now, Corey. And so it, because for one of the, and I, I feel you because I was the same way, I was like, I'm inviting in strangers to write on a topic. But what I've learned over and over again is I'm not gonna micromanage somebody's inspiration or genius. It's not my responsibility. Cooler things happen when I trust yeah. and let go. I agree. Same. Okay. One woman, what I did, I put this call out to your community for sanctuary, sunshine from your group. Yes. She was like, I'm in. And guess what? She's an effing published author in this book. She I signed on a week before we went to editing. She's good and golden. I'm just looking for her chapter right now. Um, Sunshine's and, actually in our mastermind group. Awesome. With Lauren. There yeah. she is. Look at this. Published author right there. Oh, I love book. it. <laughs> Shout and out so, to Sunshine. And, and she... We had an hour and a half long conversation. She was sitting in her car and she's like, I'm in, let's do it. Okay. Now she's a published author. And those fears that you mentioned at the very beginning, they're, they're universal. We all have them. We all have them. And so women come and they're like, I want to, I hope I can, but I don't know if I can. Yeah. What if I can't? What if I don't have anything to say? What if I'm not valuable enough? And we go through this process and we do it together. And then she comes back and she has a question, but it's a totally different question. And it's now what else can I do? I just did this impossible thing. It was easy and it was fun. So what else can I do? And for me, your very first question of was, why are we here? I'm here because I love that. I'm addicted to that and seeing women lit up about what else can I do? I'm gonna write a book and then I'm gonna start an international poetry network. One of our authors did that. That's awesome. I'm gonna write a book Sydney, and then I'm gonna go do this. Yeah. Sydney has a question for you. Can oh. you read it out loud before you answer for the audio people? You come up with a title before or after. Sydney, great question. So two things, these collaborative author books were my inspiration and I come up with the theme sort of, I, and this is where the dreaming practice comes of like, what, what story needs to be told? Okay, I'm listening. I'm not using my head. I'm using my ears and I'm using my heart. What needs to be told? And so I come up with the theme first and then I come up with the title. And then I call people in because if I didn't have the title, then there would be zero container, right? Sabrina said, there wasn't enough guidance for me yeah, to write it was scary. on it. Yeah. yeah, it was super scary because it is vague, but it's mm -hmm. open and we talk through it for people who are who are interested and like, well, what does it mean to you? Then write on that. Guess what? That's that's it. That's all you need. Um we just spent last month doing trainings for our community because anyone 
now can be can spearhead a collaborative book. If you have a community, if you have clients, if you have a group of friends that all have something in common, and you want to call them in together and publish a book, you each write a chapter, we guide you through it, we teach you how, you share the cost, everybody's a published author, everybody wins. I love that idea. Mm -hmm. She does females only. Are you female only? Red Thread Publishing is an all-female imprint. We have partnered with an another imprint. So if there's somebody behind the camera who wants to talk to me, I have guidance for them as well. Very cool. Yeah, someone behind the camera who is not a female. Thank okay. you for answering Sydney's question. Thank you for asking the question, Sydney. We appreciate it. But as far as um, singular, because she might not be trying to do collaborative. So if she's mm -hmm. a single person writing a book. Um, does she, um, oh, when, when does the title come? Great question. Okay. So that was the, I misunderstood that. Forgive me. So we very early on, we set the publishing date. Anytime somebody gets on the call with me and they're like, I think I want to publish a book. Maybe I want to publish with you. Maybe I don't. I say, set your publishing date. Let's come up with a working title. So tonight, everyone, anyone listening to this live or whenever, come up with a working title, call it whatever, but call it something now. Okay. For nonfiction, especially the title, there's some sort of naming conventions. The title should be short, two or three words. Okay. Every single best-selling book or like 90% of the best-selling books are one to three word titles. They're short. They're easy to remember. Okay. The subtitle, so your, your title can be short, to the point, one word, three words, a phrase, something that's catchy, some, maybe there's alliteration in it, something. But it does not have to say everything. It needs to be short and simple. Your subtitle, so whatever comes after the colon, can be a little bit longer, a little bit more boring, because the subtitle is when you tell your audience, this book is for you because. Okay. So, um, example, my book, How Change Really Happens. Tiny little subtitle you probably can't read. Unexpected tools of transformation. Also a bunch of keywords to make it searchable, okay? Who is this for and what, what's the promise of the book? What's the promise of the book? So title, something cute, something fun, something catchy, can be a little creative. Subtitle, please don't make your subtitle creative. Make it clear because this is your chance to catch your reader. And do this early. So it actually reminds me, this is another reason why I had a hiccup because I could not come up with a title. We I have, totally stuck on the title, which is have, so dumb. Oh, it is, but it isn't. We whichever roadblock is the one we stop at is the one that we stop at. Because I'm very much like, I'm very aware of procrastination. That's like my niche. Um, and that happens to be what the book is, procrastination. So I'm very much like, I don't put, I'm very aware of how much time I'm spending doing things. Like when I, for instance, when I'm writing my sales pages for my, for to get my leads in, sometimes I'll find myself spending an obscene amount of time just trying to perfectly like create one picture. Yep. for like the top and I'll second after about five minutes I'll be like this is such a waste of time like just put it together and let's just go and that's what really creates momentum within my yep. business because I'm always conscious of the the where I'm procrastinating at in order to like not put out the lead you know not put out the sales page because of the judgment that comes or whatever yep. my fear is so the title was like a big thing for me. So I, I even got stuck in that whole, like, just pick a title and let's just go. No one cares. Um, but Can I, I, in, in I didn't that? like I, it. Yeah. We have, we, we workshop every title because workshop. On, I'll, I'll explain. Um, unlike the titles on a sales page, the subtitle, the title and subtitle of your book really do matter. And for you to make your progress, choose something, move on. But let me go back. 
I wanted to call this book The Treasure You Seek, okay? Because the first page has a poem, a quote from Joseph Campbell, the caves you fear to enter hold the treasure you seek. And I was like, oh yeah, that's hardcore. I love it, everybody's gonna get it. But I told people what I wanted to call my book and they're like, oh, is it like an Indiana Jones romance novel? And I was like, no, not at all. <laughs> but that's, okay. I, my heart was so set on that, okay? Yes. And if I had gone ahead with that, the cover designer would have made it like dark blue and there probably would have been a hat and a lagoon and no, wrong. And every person who picked up my book would be disappointed because it wasn't what it was promised. Yeah. Um, somebody said, what's your book actually about? I said, well, you know, I've been working with clients for so long and nobody knows how change really happens. They think they're going to work with me and that immediately the life is going to be better. And it's not to get better. It actually has to get worse. So there's all these unexpected tools of transformation and they're like, holy shit, there's the title of your book. How change really happens. Unexpected tools of transformation. So what I do with people, we did this a month ago with somebody who's publishing in January. Um, we started with her working title, what she wanted to call it. I asked her to talk about what the book was about, why she wrote it, who it was for. I was listening and wrote down a couple of words keywords that are great SEO keywords, but also fundamental elements of her story. And we played with just moving things around. I said, these are the words that really resonate, that rank really high, that are gonna get you in front of the eyes of the people who really need you. And then we just move the words around like Scrabble until we had something that felt good. And that was then her title. It took 20 minutes. And so that's workshopping a title. We have software. You can look up any keyword and find out how many people are searching it on Google, how many other competitors are using that same keyword, how much money is pulled in monthly for that keyword. Okay. Keywords maybe. I found a keyword last week for $146,000 a month with 52 competitors. We're gonna use that keyword. Most keywords, you're lucky if there's like 16 to $30,000. $146,000 keyword. Yeah, let's use it. And it's not intuitive. Yesterday we were talking to an author. She's writing a book about creative genius. And so we looked up the keyword creative genius. She's like, this is gonna be great. $3 <laughs> and like, 1200 competitors. I don't want my share of $3. I want my share of 146,000. This is all technical and this is why it's nice to have somebody who knows the industry a little bit to like sprinkle that stuff in. But Sabrina, if you wanted to spend 25 minutes with me, we could workshop your title and then you could need a new excuse why you haven't. Ah, yes, girl, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm all about it. I'm all about it. So we got, I don't know, we got like 10 minutes left. Any last questions? What do we got for a close up here? Or anything? Oh, you wanted to talk about the writer circle, Sierra? Yeah. Um, well, just I, since I'm here and you have an awesome community, um, we've opened up our weekly writers circle for free for anybody who wants to join. You sign up anytime from now until the end of August and you get a whole month. That's four sessions. It's Tuesdays, noon Eastern. They are live. We have special guest speakers as well as just continually dipping into this four part process. As a reminder, some of us are stronger with some elements and are nauseous about other elements, but all four of these pieces work really well together. We don't dictate when or how you do them, but it's really nice to have them all in your sort of arsenal of storytelling so that when you don't feel like writing, you don't write when the spark hasn't. And knowing the difference, honestly, between when you're really struggling because you're stuck on a fear or a doubt rather than, oh, I'm not actually inspired right now. And there's a huge difference. I'm 
such a fan of discomfort. I think if you're uncomfortable, you're probably doing something right, okay? So I wanna be very clear to be so, to learn that difference so that we don't stop when we're afraid. We don't stop when, when we're like, oh my God, I'm terrified. We, we work the process or we reach out to somebody in the community or we share and we say, I'm totally freaking out right now. And then seven people say, I know exactly what you mean. I was just da, da, da. Or, so, you know, sometimes you don't want someone to tell you you're going to do it and you're going to be fine and it's going to be great. You know, sometimes you need the cheerleader and sometimes you need the commiseration. But either way, you've said it, you've owned it. And I hear this all the time from our authors because they come to me and they say, I'm struggling with this. I said, that's great. Go post it in the community. I have a question. Great. Go post it in the community. I heard back from somebody the other day when she did this, she's like, well, actually a really interesting thing happened. By the time I figured out what it was that I was struggling with in order to post it, I actually had solved my own problem. Ah, I love it. And then I just got all this great feedback from people, but I was already over it. And I said, yes, because that, and then you become the leader, you're modeling for others. They're learning from you. You think you're being vulnerable or asking for help. Guess what? You just like led the pack. And so it's just this cool thing. Absolutely. Lauren. So come, come to Writer Circle. We've got lots of, um, yeah, lots of really incredible speakers. Somebody who writes for the New York Times is going to be joining us. Former editor Simon & Schuster is coming to join us in the next couple of months. Poet laureates, really just like amazing people. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit more stuff. Lauren, what do you got? Um, I'm, my head is is swirling with this anthology idea um, mm -hmm. or collectives, and I'm wondering if you're a new author like me, and I don't have a, I don't have a name, I don't have anything uh, published. Um, if you are published in a collaborative, mm -hmm. do other publishers, hybrid or mainstream traditional, uh, are they more? Are you more appealing to them or less appealing to them because you've published in another Great forum? Question. Question. That is a very good question. I think it actually has to do with the the success or lack thereof of the book itself. Okay, so is it ranking well? Is it getting reviewed? Is it good? Basically, right? There's so many books now on Amazon that are no good, mm -hmm. either because people didn't take the time or they didn't know what they were doing. And so you can publish and it's there and it has two reviews and it seems like somebody's cousin and somebody's partner probably reviewed their book. And, you know, eh, like it didn't get enough of the attention that it deserved. To, and then if it's good, if it like... If it, so, Here's, so here's the thing, any sort of independently published book, any book actually that gets 100 reviews or more on Amazon gets the attention, deserves the attention of publishers, traditional publishers, because you go look and some of these traditionally published books don't get reviewed there. Really, they don't. And so 100 reviews is sort of the, the gold ticket but it's not the only thing that traditional publishers look for. I was on a call with Liz Connor, who is the, I don't know, consigning editor, commissioning editor for one of the Penguin Random House imprints, okay? And she was, she was talking about what the quali like qualifying factors to be considered. And if you don't have more than 70,000 followers, they don't even think about it because they've done the math and they're like, well, if 5% of these people's followers buy the book, then we'll make this much money and we can work with that and grow from there. But if there's fewer than 70,000 followers, that's what she said for Penguin Random House. They just don't do it. They don't even touch you. So there's all, it's, it's not going to make or break you, but there's multiple variables. 
That's so interesting that it's based on followers now because at one point there was no social media. So mm -hmm. it was just based off of they read the book, they liked the book and decided to put money into it. It was based off anything no. else. No, well, it was still saleability. We can sell this. Is yeah. That um, but now that you're not even yeah. considered unless you have the followers. Yeah. Wow. So, but Harry Potter, you know how many times Harry Potter was rejected? Yeah. Because there, there wasn't a market. They were like, we don't know how to sell this. It's written by a woman, but is it for kids? It's sort of adult for kids and it's a sort of kid for adults. So we don't know where to put it wow. until somebody was like, guess what? We're gonna figure out where to put it and we're gonna put the shit out of it, right? And they did a great job, but it wasn't scooped up. I think it was rejected like 128 times. So there's 127 publishers that feel like idiots, right? <laughs> but- Really big idiots. But yeah. it has to be, but maybe they couldn't sell it, so they shouldn't have. And the people who did pick it up that's saw true. something that nobody else could see. And so like, that's the right connection. That's okay. the right connection. And so, I always think of the scene in um, Pretty Woman when Julia Roberts goes back into the fancy store and she's like, remember you kicked me out? Yes. Think huge. Like I, whenever I think of JK Rowling, I think of like, she could go into all of those publishers and just, say that <laughs> yeah 100. but this is this is the act so i always say that writing and publishing is an act of love and faith mm. and that you show up because you love your story because you love your audience because you love to write and share it and faith because you're doing it and there's no proof that you'll be successful but you do it anyway and people are like, but give me proof. I said, but there's no faith. If I give you proof, there's no faith. So. I love it. <sighs> yeah. Great stuff. So appreciate you being here. This has been really fun. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. I want to give a shout out to everyone who's still hanging out, watching out, watching live. Thank you for being here and hanging out with us while we learn about um, writing, editing, and publishing books. Does anyone else have any more questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. This was fantastic for me. I took a ton of notes. So super excited to get back on the bandwagon of where I left off about a year, over a year ago. Um, I hope we have a private chat. What's going on? Can, and can I just say that if anybody, any of you all, but also anybody listening or tuning in, we'd love to hear from you. We have an open community of support um, that's free. And we just really we're on a mission and I, I usually say this at the very beginning but red threads on a mission to support 10,000 women to become successful published authorpreneurs and thought leaders because it's women women's voices have been missing from this story and so everything that we do is to position women who have something to say to go say it and make those waves because the world needs these voices now more than ever for sure Love Definitely. to hear from anybody yeah I love it. Um, thank you so much for joining us here on her version. I hope you received some helpful information on writing, editing, and publishing your soon to be book. The content here was amazing. I learned so much and I hope you did too. If you resonated for it, for instance, is Sydney here with any of the ladies here. Um, Sierra's information is right here on the ticker bar as we speak. Same with Lauren's, uh, Maureen's, who is uh, who left the screen, Sam and myself. So anyone who you resonated with, make sure you follow them, um, website, social media, and the like. If you have an amazing story to share, her um, here on Her Version, we tell stories of struggle to triumph. So be sure to reach out to me at herversion.life. I am your host, Sabrina Victoria, and I'm so grateful to be here sharing a platform that allows people to share their truth and inspire other 